good morning, Jeff. Well, welcome to Conversations with uh, Brand New. And uh, bef as before we get on to the other side of the questions and the interview, would you want to tell us a little bit about your background and yourself? Sure, I'd be happy to, and thank you, uh, thank you for having me here. Um, in in some ways, I think I've got a pretty straightforward background, but I have had a lot of interesting twists and turns along the way. But my uh, professional background, really, for almost thirty years at this point, I've been in the field of strategy consulting, and um, really focused all of my time on helping companies grow in a variety of different ways. So over that time, I've worked across all different industries, um, and really seen just about every growth challenge there is out there. Uh, a lot of what I write about and talk about these days, along with my co-author, Steve, is built on the experience that we've had in consulting to some of the world's top companies over that period of time and noticing what's shifting and has been shifting over the course of the last five years or so. But from a professional standpoint, um, that's, uh, that's where I come from. I am the father of four now grown uh, men, I suppose I should call them, though sometimes they act like little boys still. Um, I'm uh, originally Canadian, grew up in the UK, and I'm happy to tell you whatever else you'd like to know about me, but uh, there's lots of interesting other facets along the way. Fantastic, fantastic. Thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, uh, do you think, you know, strategy is an overused term, but very underimplemented? Um, I... I Yes, I would say strategy is probably overused. Whether it's underimplemented or not, I, I, I think it depends on what you, what you describe as implementation. Is it implemented well universally? Absolutely not. Uh, I would say that just about every, every company out there thinks that they have a strategy or they've gone through some sort of strategic planning process and they, they claim to understand the direction they need to be going in. But a lot of the time, what, what people put forward, what companies put forward as a strategy isn't actually a strategy. As, as Steve and I um, often talk about, a strategy doesn't count unless you've actually made choices along the way. That's something that we learned from our dear friend and, and mentor, Roger Martin, who you probably know um, well about. And uh, as, uh, as he is, is fond of saying, and, and as Steve and I certainly believe, um, ultimately, a strategy is only as good as the choices that you make. And unless you can point to something you're choosing to do and something you're choosing not to do and, and support that choice with data and logic, you really don't have a strategy. And there's not many companies out there who have gone to that level of detail in, in thinking through their, uh, th through their future through that lens. Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm on the same page as you. I meant a suboptimal implementation, you know? Right. Yeah, you know, so yes. So moving forward, um, and this is probably because maybe I have a branding, advertising, media background, uh, and I love the titles of your book, you know, pardon the pun, uh, uh, both the books are, you know, the titles are purposefully provocative, whether it right. is uh, detonate and whether it is a new one provoke. Uh, uh, is it a way of signaling that, listen, time to wake up, smell the coffee? Uh, well, certainly we, we wanted to create some eye-catching titles. Um, I, I, the... Detonate was probably a little more eye-catching than we had originally anticipated. A little known fact, or at least little known to us at the time when we wrote it, is that detonate, um, the, the word, is actually uh, not allowed to be said in U.S. federal airspace. And so um, that has caused all sorts of interesting challenges, most of them, most of them quite humorous when, uh, when uh, friends of ours and clients of ours have been reading the books on, airline, uh, reading the books on airlines. Uh, but ultimately, yes, we, we did try to come up with somewhat provocative titles, but they also have some deeper meaning and, and they link to the key ideas in the book in a way that, uh, that we're, we're comfortable with the, with the titles that we ended up choosing for both books. And I love the way, just as a small tangential aside, you know, that you've used Tom Fishburn, uh, again, a very close aide and marketomist uh, to kind of explain storytelling in a far more impactful manner. You know? I think that's a very nice uh, line of thinking. You know? Congratulations. Yeah, well, thank you. And, and I'm sure our readers thank us as well for that, because he has literally saved them thousands of words of writing through his cartoon. So that's been it's been a good partnership. Brevity, brevity. Three cheers to brevity. Exactly. So, you know, I, obviously, you know, the business landscape, you know, is rapidly evolving, changing. Uh, you know, do you think, um, you know, best practices are best left to the in the back burner or completely ignored? Um, well, as I think most readers, of, at least of the cover of our first book, Detonate, know we believe that the best we need to get beyond best practices to uh, continue to thrive and, and to survive into the future. Although 
our, our message around best practices and our, our message around um, how to manage in the face of uncertainty is more nuanced than that. I, I don't think either Steve or I would say that every best practice needs to be thrown out, but the reality is all of us need to strike balances in our businesses and understand that there is a time for best practices and managing the existing business as we have in the past, in which case lessons from the past will probably be helpful. But there's increasingly opportunity that is well beyond the core business and well beyond the traditional playbooks of how to get things done effectively. And that's where we actually need to ignore best practices. And, and getting that balance right is really, really difficult because it does require, whether you call it the uh, ambidextrous mind or, or just achieving balance, it does require having two fundamental, uh, fundamentally different skill sets to continue to advance. I think we can dovetail based on your articulation, we can dovetail into our next uh, question, which is, uh, you know, beginner's mindset. And uh, very recently, we had a beautiful conversation with Amar Kaisi. He's written a wonderful book titled Ambitious, mm -hmm. um, uh, combining humility and ambition. Okay, uh, so you, you recommend there is enough of humility floating. I, I'm definitely, there is a lot of ambition, type A personalities, hippos and all of that floating around. But do you think there is a nice balance of hum humility and ambition floating around in the corporate zeitgeist among senior leaders, business leaders? Uh, a nice balance, no. I, I, I do think there, there are good pockets of humility here and there. And, and um, sometimes humility is described as or is disguised as genuine curiosity. Sometimes it, I think it's hard to tell the difference between humility and curiosity, because ultimately, if we're being humble in the face of the unknown and in, in the face of a future that is not going to be guided by lessons of the past, we do need to be curious. We need to, to, to let loose the notion that we can predict the way things are going to be and that we can use past data and, and algorithms to guess effectively what we need to do in the future. Um, I would say in the most successful companies, you see a far heavier dose of humility traveling through the ranks than you do in some of the more entrenched, um, likely less to be, uh, uh, unlikely to be as successful companies. And that's really at the heart of what, of what the beginner's mind requires. Uh, right. you know, there's lots of different ways to bring a beginner's perspective to the table. Sometimes it's enabling humility amongst leaders, but, but a lot of the time it's actually just bringing different points of view and, and true beginners to the table to help make some decisions. Also, maybe a beginning with an I don't know philosophy. You don't need to be know it yep. all. You know, we could be a learn it all as Satya Nadella would have uh, called it, right? You know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's a hard lesson to unlearn for senior executives who have made their um, careers and, and been successful because they have actually known the industry and known the businesses that they've been running. Right, right, right. So where would you be if we do a poll uh, in terms of strategy? Uh, do you want a future back strategy or a present forward one? And I'd say it in the context of, um, uh, say, if you look at uh, the seminal work of Andy Grove in Only the Paranoid Survive, you know, he mentioned something very beautifully that when spring comes, snow melts at the edges because that is the one that is most exposed in the periphery, right? right. So where, where is your vote going? Well, so I, I think absolutely pleasant, present forward is what we need to be thinking about. I, as, as you know, Suresh, um, from having read our books, we are strong adherents to the notion that we are increasingly being impacted by exponential change in, in all facets of our life, not just our business life. And that's, that's only going to con continue and it's going to accelerate. So the notion that we are being impacted by exponential change means that every um, X period of time, we're going to see change happening far faster than it ever has before it. By, by definition, it will double over certain periods of time. If that's the case, then taking lessons from the past are, is simply not going to be helpful, except in the very, very immediate future. And, and the half-life of that, of the value of those lessons from the past will continue to decrease. So the best, the best way to manage, and, and, and with that, by the way, with that exponential change, we shift from a world that is governed primarily by risk, and by definition, risk is measurable and therefore manageable, to a world that's governed by uncertainty. And whereas in the old world of risk, the, the old, you know, using data, using surveys, using public opinion polls, what have you, to try to get a sense for what's happening, uh, what's li li likely to come next, work just fine. But in the face of uncertainty, you're actually going to get it wrong if you use those old tools. And, and that's where we need to act differently to, to manage from the present forward. So maybe an analogy based on what you just shared is could be that, uh, you know, one is an impressionist painting 
which is a vision, which is a possibility, a landscape that could emerge. And the other one is actually a picture. The past is a picture because it is defined, it's already happened and you're aware of it. And whereas the future could be more like an impressionist painting, you know, you're, uh, it's never going to be picture perfect as they say, but I think uh, we need to have those more of those impressionist paintings that you begin to vision and, you know, kind of walk that path you know, and ready for surprises, yeah. you know, that's right. Yeah, I, I like that. I like that metaphor. I like that analogy. Although the only way I'd adjust it is to say I'd like multiple impressionistic paintings. So we, the, especially again, in the today context that we are today, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I, if the the only way to look forward, uh, as we just talked about with humility, is with an acknowledgement that we don't know the way the world is going to turn out. So we can't use a single picture, a single very high relief picture. We need to have multiple different versions of what the uh, of what the future is going to turn out. So give me give me four or five or six impressionistic paintings over a picture any day. Okay. So uh, I'm sure it must have been brewing in both your minds, uh, both the books, you know, I mean, uh, Detonate and Provoke. Uh, what is the key trigger point? You know, what is that point which says, okay, now we must go into a book uh, for both, both the titles that you wrote along with uh, Steve? What was the trigger, trigger point? Trigger to, point, to yeah, write yeah. Books? Right there, yeah. Right. Uh, well, uh, the the story of Detonate or the origination story of Detonate is um, really just born out of Steve and I recognizing that we had worked together for decades and decades and decades, or I shouldn't say that many decades, about two decades um, uh, together. And, and we had seen a lot of things that were great in the business world that were very effective from a strategic and growth perspective with our clients. And a lot of things where clients just said, I, I really don't understand why we do things this way. It drives me crazy to go to work every day and to do X activity, recognizing that it really adds no value. And so it was a it was a it was a single discussion we had, I think, probably over drinks like usual um, uh, four or five years ago, where we came to the observation that there's actually a lot of stuff going on in some of the world's most successful companies that adds absolutely no value. And the crazy thing is the people in those companies know that they add no value, yet they still show up every single day and they execute those activities. So that that was the spark that led to detonate, no pun intended, um, and uh, provoke followed from there, but for slightly different reasons. All right. OK. Uh, Nicholas Taleb in his book, Anti-Fragile, uh, mentions about uh, that, you know, as long as there is an upside amidst the chaos, okay, uh, more upside than downside, you know, I mean, uh, he, he urges uh, organizations and leaders to go for it. W what would be your thoughts? About whether to go for the upside amongst, amongst the chaos? Because amongst the chaos, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd, my advice would be try to avoid the chaos to begin with. Some of it is actually unavoidable, but, you know, chaos, especially in, in your own organization, can sometimes be an own goal. It's something that you can cause uh, yourself or a, a group of individuals can cause themselves because they actually don't have a clear path forward and a recognition that, that the path forward may not be the right one, but at least they're trying to go do things. So when I, when I see chaos in big successful organizations these days, it's because people are um, running by the, 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 I think the false maxim that failure is good. So I, I wanna go on record to say that Steve and I don't believe that failure is good. We think failure is actually a bad thing and actually a better way of operating instead of, uh, instead of sim essentially saying to everyone, go try whatever you want because if you fail, it's not gonna matter. A better way of operating is to say, look, have a, have a hypothesis about what you're trying to achieve take a very small step forward and see what happens. If it ends up to be the right path, then continue. If it doesn't end up being the right path, then course correct, but always do it in, a, in the smallest testable increment that you can. And if you, if you act with those, what we call in the books, minimally viable moves, you will not fail. And in all likelihood, you can avoid chaos. It doesn't mean that everyone's gonna be moving in the same direction at the same time, but at least when you see someone doing something, you can ask them for the theory of the case for why they're headed in that direction and why they're testing the hypothesis that they are. Especially in the context, I think there seems to be birds of the same feather flocking together, right? You know, it may not be relevant for the industry or the vertical or the business they are in, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, every once in a while, those birds do actually get it right. And, and you come up with a, with a wild new discovery that no one had ever really thought of before. Uh, you know, I think you mentioned about this five models of provocation in your book. Um, you know, uh, but either to be used in isolation or in kind of aggregation. You want to just quickly talk us through that? Sure. Yeah. So the, it's probably worth setting the context, though, for how those five moves, uh, five modes of provocation, the five provoke strategies, um, what the context that they live in, though. So 
as I've said in a couple of times now, we believe that we're living in a world that's increasingly governed by uncertainty. Right. And with that, as we accept uncertainty, we also need to accept that uncertainties do resolve. They just do. They don't stay uncertain forever. Some uncertainties just kind of go away because they were never bound to turn into anything. So if you think about the Y2K computer scare, which increasingly I'm, found, I'm finding um, um, some of our new leaders actually don't remember that because they weren't alive. But those of us that were alive at the time remember right. that back in the year, back in the year 2000, there was, a, there was a wild concern that the world was going to shut down because our computers couldn't possibly switch over to the year 2000. And lo and behold, it didn't happen. We were just fine. But a lot of time, uncertainties do actually turn out to be real. And when they, when they resolve into something real, they go from being a question of if they're going to happen to being a question of when they're going to happen. Something that Steve and I call and provoke the phase change from if to when. And, and, and when they're in that when phase, it doesn't mean we know everything about them. We don't necessarily know the landing point or the rate of change or what have you. But we know that that uncertainty is actually going to happen. So the five provoke strategies um, exist through that phase change from if to when. The most foundational, and, and I would argue that probably the most important uh, uh, of the provoke strategies happens earliest in that phase, that, and is one that we call envision. So going back to the discussion we had about multiple impressionistic paintings, this is the, the, the art or the science of scenario planning, where we have the humility to say, we don't know the way the world is going to turn out, but we will at least bring into to stark relief four, it's usually four in, in, in scenario planning done right, four equally plausible uh, versions of the future that we can plan against. And we will actually place bets against all four of those uh, in proportion to how likely we think any one of those futures is likely to come true. That's what the envision uh, provocation is. The next one is position. Once, we, once we're seeing the world through multiple different lenses and how it might turn out, positioning, actively placing our bets to account for multiple different ways of the, of the future turning out is how we best put ourselves in a position to be able to see the phase change from if to when. If we're actually out and investing in, even if it's in very small ways, say, say it's investing in a startup or investing in a sensing mechanism and in the least likely scenario, if we're actually present in, in that reality coming true, we will see the phase change from if to when sooner than others. Our, our, the entire premise, or I shouldn't say the entire, but one of the premises behind Provoke is that the best leaders act in the face of uncertainty to be able to see the phase change earlier and then act with purpose when it's happening to move through it. So envision and position allow you to see it sooner. The acting with purpose are the other three provocations, the other three provoke strategies. So one has to do with, one's called drive. It has to do with driving to the future in which you have advantage because you have a clear line of sight and because you have some degree of control over the way the future is going to unfold. Uh, the second of the, of the three, um, as you act through the uh, phase changes to uh, activate. So this is where you may have a clear line of sight for where you want to get to, but you don't have primary influence in the way the world is going to turn out. You have to influence others. You need to activate an ecosystem in order to all work together to try to achieve something. And then the final provocation is one that we call adapt. Sometimes the world just isn't headed to a future that is going to be best for the business model that we have today. And the best leaders, again, with, humil with humility, will say, you know what, that, we're not fit for purpose for that world. So either we're going to significantly adapt our business model, or in some cases, we'll just wind down the business. We'll return the, the money to our shareholders and we'll call it a day. Not many people are willing to do that. That's probably the hardest move in business, but that's what we mean by adapt. So <clears throat> that's probably a longer, a longer answer than you were looking for, Suresh, but those are the five. Uh, I, I think I, I think you were very inspired of the longish uh, thing. You know, I think it's very succinct and it yeah, you know, gets the message across. Uh, you know, yeah, what if, let's wait and watch, uh, are byproducts of a system which is huge and big on uh, hitting quarterly numbers? Right, you know, how do leaders break away from the shackles? Well, in the I would say in the very short term, the only way that leaders get released from that perspective is if their shareholders allow them to be released from it. As long as share, and I'm talking primarily about public companies here. Of right. course, there are other listed companies, yeah, companies. Yeah. But if we've got quarterly results that we need to meet, and the shareholders and the analysts are holding us accountable to hit those numbers. It's human nature for leaders to hit those numbers and do everything that they can to hit those numbers. Increasingly, in some sectors, though, we're seeing that that's not all that shareholders are paying attention to. And you know, one of the ideas that Steve and I 
talk a lot about in, in settings like this is that that we have lived in a world forever where change has felt risky. So the status quo has felt safe because we know it and it feels stable and to change something feels risky. We're in a very strange time now, and I think increasingly this will be the case where we have to shift from thinking of the, of the status quo as feeling safe and change as being risky to the opposite where change and trying to do things differently should feel safe and the status quo should feel risky. And if, if our shareholders, at least for a portion of their expectations, can start to hold leaders accountable to say, if you were just sitting still, if you're not adapting your business model, if you're not going and trying things, not failing, but trying to do things differently and not think only of delivering in the short term, if you're not trying to do that, then you're being risky and you're being risky with our capital. And I, as, I, as I mentioned, we are starting to see that take hold in some corners of the market. If you think about the energy market, for example, these days, although it's very imbalanced in, very, in various different parts of the world and expectations are, are, are shifting in different ways, but you're hearing pretty clearly from shareholders, whether it's around ESG expectations or getting the big energy companies to invest in renewables, you're, you're hearing pretty clearly the status quo and the old way of, of extracting oil from the ground and selling it through an outdated system is not what they're looking for. And it's, I, I think those early signals of, of real change in industries are some interesting ones to pay attention to. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, allow me to quote from this uh, Ernest Hemingway book, The Sun Also Rises. Okay, right. and there is a beautiful, very three-word uh, three line which says, gradually, then suddenly. Okay, and this is exactly how disruption happens and this how the future Absolutely. kind of arrives, right? Um, so, you know, in legacy businesses, how do we kind of make sure that there is an, uh, you know, appropriate level of preparation? for something like this, you know, at least a mindset or a culture, you know, because, you know, we talked about pivot, I think far too often in the last 24 months, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, is, is this something that can be culturally or strategically ingrained into organizations? Yes, although culture is very hard to impact on purpose. And what I mean by that is, is culture is derivative of what we do. Culture is, and when I say we do, I mean, as organizations, it's derivative of the moves we make in the market. It's derivative of the talent we hire. It's derivative of how we hold each other accountable day in, day out at work. All the various different things that we do, the behaviors we enact as human beings is ultimately what leads to culture. So the gradually then suddenly, which is a phrase I love, by the way, and, and we've heard various different manifestations of that in, in lots of different walks of life. Um, but but the, the way, if I had to imagine a company that successfully moves from a traditional business model to a new one, riding on the curve of exponential change, it's where, first of all, real respect is paid for the traditional business model. There's always a period of time for any company that goes through a shift. There's a period of time where the core business, the traditional business model, is the funding machine for all the exploratory exercises. And if the people running the core business feel as though they're disrespected or they're not part of the innovation journey, it's very difficult to make everyone feel as though they're in the same boat together, all trying to head in the same direction. So respect for that core business for some period of time is, is really important. Secondly, and this is still part of the, the gradually component of this, putting out those uh, minimally viable moves to try out new things and to explore new spaces in those various scenarios that we talked about before is something that feels like it takes some time, but it is quite, well, maybe not literally, but, but metaphorically, those are the seeds you're planting for the future growth of the business. And unless you are planting those seeds and patiently, in some cases, waiting to see what happens from those moves in the market, you're not actually, you're not actually making any sort of progress and you're adhering too much to the traditional business model. The suddenly comes when one of those seeds actually does take hold and there is a new opportunity for a company to do things in fundamentally different ways. And that's where Steve and I would argue you have to act, you have to really act with purpose and, and disproportionately allocate your capital to go and pursue that new opportunity, which you have some early proof is going to be the, the future of the company. And that's where you can see it, it may have been five, six, seven years of planting seeds and, and, and respecting the core business. But when you see an opportunity to shift the business, that's something that should happen really quickly because the, the, old, the old fast follower strategy we think is dead. You've got to be a first mover these days if you want to take advantage of exponential change. So would, would this actually relate to, say, for example, Amazon's acquisition of Whole Foods 
or um, Gillette going into a subscription driven model, uh, just like the Dollar Shave Club, you know? Well, yeah. Uh, well, Gillette's an interesting example, and I need to be very careful in, in interviews <laughs> like this because some of these some of these companies are um, are clients uh, are clients of ours. <laughs> um, but but yes, I'd say um, let, let's focus on Amazon acquiring Whole Foods. I, that that I think was a it looked to many on the outside like a kind of strange move for a what is what has been historically an internet company and internet. Right arguably a fulfillment company to get into the grocery business. But you look at the way that they're using their physical presence these days. And, and actually they were the, they were one of the leaders of the move on from online to bricks and mortar again. But, you know, if you think about what Amazon's job was for a very long time, the act of fulfillment and let alone all the sale of goods online, but the act of fulfilling those sales in a way that really pleased customers, they now have a massive footprint to be able to go and, and be the fulfillment uh, engine of choice for customers. It's a very different use of the Whole Foods footprint than Whole Foods was using itself then. And I'm not arguing that that's the entirety of what Amazon did when they when they bought um, Whole Foods, but that that's, I, I think, a really interesting move. I think a more interesting move, if we're talking about Amazon, is, is AWS. And I, again, I don't claim to know what, what happened on the inside there, but it was pretty clear that they developed um, AWS early on, primarily for Amazon's purposes, and then really went all in when they understood what that what that cloud business could be. And then, of course, and now, of course, AWS. I, I actually don't know what portion of Amazon's business it is, but it's pretty. Do it's certainly dominant in the market, and it's a dominant proportion of the money that they're making. Yeah, internally, I'm told they call it awesome. A W S O M E, awesome business. <laughs> <laughs> but it is it is a pretty awesome business. <laughs> Okay, I know I'm sensitive about your time, uh, Jeff, you know, uh, so just before you leave, finally, uh, just uh, take us through, talk us through the three provocators uh, that you make, a, that you wave the flag for in your book, uh, you know, uh, that you've been kind of really, really uh, inspired by. Yeah, and, and it's, this, is a, this is an ongoing conversation. We'd love to get the word out about this because when, you know, when Steve and I were thinking about Provoke, obviously, we always want to bring the ideas to, to life through real stories, but I think a lot of folks look at Detonate and Provoke and believe they're business books. They are business books, but they're really leadership books. And what, what intrigued us about the notion of, of provocateurs and provocation is they, they can happen in all walks of life. So we actually purposely chose three people who all have some degree of a business experience and business background, but actually they're provocative in very different types of settings. And so just very quickly, the, in terms of running through who they are, Valerie Rainford um, was one of the folks that we profiled. Valerie is the CEO and founder of a company called Ellery Talent Strategies, which um, helps companies understand uh, their unspoken and, and ingrained biases around, around uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and helps them overcome that and do things in different ways. Valerie came by that knowledge naturally herself as a Black woman who grew up in the Federal Reserve uh, here in the U.S. and then at, at J.P. Morgan as the most senior Black woman at J.P. Morgan running their DEI initiative, she learned how difficult it was to actually shift some of the world's most impressive and most entrenched financial institutions and really create a different type of environment. And she, th though I don't think anyone would say she did that single-handedly, she was a massive driving force behind that at those companies. And the story of where Valerie came from and what she was able to achieve uh, at, at those companies and beyond is, is a really impressive one and, and is, is really at the heart of the definition that we have in mind when we thought about provocateurs. A second person that we profiled, very different walk of life, was a, a man by the name of Ryan Gravel. Ryan is uh, the visionary behind the Atlanta Beltline, uh, which for anyone that has been to Atlanta, will they'll know that that is a, a multi-purpose um, urban land use essentially um, circling the city of Atlanta where we have, where, where there's park space. Uh, it's all, it, it's on old disused train tracks that he built this around. And it's, it's essentially a way to get people to mingle in the city in different ways than they have historically. It was inspired by his experience walking around Paris when he was a graduate student and he came back to Atlanta and thought there is a better way to get more integ integrative communities interacting together. And he um, was uh, he was the person behind what is now one of the most successful urban land projects um, and, and not not all not universally successful, not not uh, successful the entire time, but one of the um, most interesting and successful urban land projects that we've seen here in the US. 
Uh, the third and final person we profiled is a woman by the name of Debbie Beal. Um, Debbie is the founder of the Posse Foundation, which uh, for many folks who are, again, based here in the U.S. will know is, is a, uh, an organization that, without going into the, the details of the model, um, sends posses, so groups of 10 students from who are natural leaders, but they may come from less advantaged areas and they may, may not have access to top tier universities, but sends them as a posse, a group of 10 students to some of the most um, prestigious universities in the world so that they can work together as a self-reinforcing system and help each other succeed and, and graduate and go out into the workforce. The purpose of posse uh, is to literally to change the face of leadership in the world. Um, and, and when I say literally, I mean, actually the, the looks of leaders who are not a lot of white men running, running the world. Um, and, and we actually have a different set of leaders out there in all walks of life, not just the business world, but in government and beyond. And, and all of this was inspired 33 years ago, I think it was when Debbie, um, was a herself, a, um, working at a nonprofit in New York City, where she had met a student who was super high achieving, a great leader. Um, he, he was black and he, I believe he was black. He may have been Latino, uh, but he went off to college. He came back a year later or less than a year later. And he remarked to, to Debbie, you know, I never, would have, I never would have dropped out if I had my posse with me. And that's what led to the idea behind the Posse Foundation and what she's been able to achieve with that organization has been really impressive. So th those are the three people we profile in the book. Steve and I have actually launched a new podcast called The Provocateurs. It's something that uh, Deloitte, our company, is doing in conjunction with an outfit called Thinkers 50 out of the UK. Thinkers 50 is the organization that ranks the top management thinkers in the world. And what we're doing is we are profiling a provocateur every single month um, and, and telling equally inspiring and, and um, really compelling stories about how people act to change the world. So I hope you and I hope uh, many of your readers and, and listeners will... Uh, We'll have a look at that as well. Definitely. In fact, uh, just uh, before we conclude, uh, you know, I mean, just I think four or five days back, uh, Debbie Millman, not another Debbie, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, she was on our podcast, on our, uh, uh, we were having a conversation and she's part of the Thinkers 50 uh, as well. And uh, yes, right. I, I definitely will. Uh, I'll start subscribing to that as well and share it with my team members as well. I'm sure it'll be very, very truly purposefully provocative and stimulating and ask all the questions, right? Isn't it? You know, who are asking yeah. the questions, you know, right? <laughs> so exactly. uh, thank you so much, uh, Jeff, for doing this. We definitely Absolutely. miss Steve as well. Uh, convey our regards to his family and uh, safe travels and good luck and we'll be in touch. And just thank before you. I That's sign right. off, you mentioned about... Uh, disadvantaged societies and people who don't have access to the Ivy League um, uh, universities. We've done a small message, of probably in our own small little way, provoking them. I will send you an email of that. You take a look at it. Please do. And, yeah, and I would love, love, love your thoughts as well. Yeah, great. Okay. Thanks, Thanks so time, much. Suresh. Take care. Nice Good luck. Same here. Bye-bye.